it's the phrase, mind the, the gap. Mind the gap. So this is the phrase that, you know, the trains, the, the subway thing is pulling up, the, the tubes, they call it, and the, the subway train is pulling up. And please mind the gap, please mind the gap, please mind the gap. Over and over again, you hear this all over, you know, all the time in, in London. Please mind the gap. And if you have a vivid imagination like me, you have a lot of questions about why they're so insistent on you minding the gap. Like someone didn't mind the gap once, and, and, and then minding the gap just sounds very British too. Like someone must have gotten their foot caught. I don't know. I don't even want to think about what it is. My imagination can go all kinds of places, right? There must have been something horrible that happened for them to be so insistent on minding the gap. When you think about gaps between, you know, gaps can be frustrating. They can cause us problems. It's why they tell you to measure twice, cut once, right? Because otherwise you might have a gap between the, you know, you're cutting a piece of wood and you cut it too short or you cut it too long and there's a gap between the length it is and the length it should be. And gaps can be frustrating with carpentry projects, but they can be even more frustrating with our lives. And we we have many things that we can think of where there's a gap between the way we wish things were and the way they are. And, and, And they can be, when we look at the world and we consider what's going on in the world, we go, here's the way things are, here's the way I things, the way I wish things were, and there's a significant gap between those. And it can, it can be disturbing. And then even more disturbing sometimes is when we look at our own lives and we go, there's a gap between the way I am and the way I wish I was. And we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is, is looking at the world as it is, and he's describing the way his kingdom is. And there's a significant gap between the two. And then he's describing the way people tend to think about pleasing God and the way you actually please God. And then once again, there's a gap between what people think and the way it actually is. And so there's these series of kind of contrasts that we'll see in the Sermon on the Mount where his kingdom is so different from all the world's kingdoms. And there's this gap between our old self and this new life that God is calling us to, and we'll see these things as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. But we're going to start, we're going to jump in in Matthew chapter 5, read the first three verses, and then we'll stop and and talk about these three points that we're going to see as we study the Sermon on the Mount over the next few weeks. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So we see right away at the very beginning, this is the the, Jesus is near the Sea of Galilee. He's on a high place near the Sea of Galilee. He's on a a, what's described as the mountain. And he goes up onto the mountain. He's these crowds, and he gets away with his disciples, and he sits with them, and they gather near, and he sits down. And he's going to offer some official teaching. He's going to offer from this seated position at this time in culture. This was, this was in a, you know, when a rabbi sat down with his disciples around him. This was a kind of a formal lecture time. This is a time of instructing them about who he is and about his teachings. And it's his disciples that the Sermon on the Mount is directed towards. And that word disciple is, you know, one we throw around quite a bit in church. But it's this idea of a student, someone who is a learner. They're there to learn how to, to pattern their lives after Jesus. And so three points that we'll talk about. The first point is this. The Sermon on the Mount is both familiar and unfamiliar. The Sermon on the Mount has 108 verses. There's three chapters. It would take you, you know, 10, 15 minutes, depending on how fast of a reader you are, to read through the whole thing. And it's something that's very familiar in a lot of ways. And here's, here's one way. It's familiar in the sense that if you breeze through the whole Sermon on the Mount, you will find so many familiar verses all in one place. And you might be surprised at how many of them. It's like, oh, that's, I, we, we quote that one all the time, or we talk about that one all the time, or that's my favorite verse, and it's right there in the same place. And here's some examples. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, the one we just read. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, right? This is like a pretty popular, pretty famous verse. There's the, the verses about, about asking, seeking, and knocking. Knocking the door will be opened unto you. The passage about salt and light, we just taught from that a few weeks ago. That's also in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be anxious about tomorrow, this teaching of Jesus about 
worry. That's the Sermon on the Mount. The, the build your house on the rock where we get that great kid song, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. I loved that song when I was a kid. Um, there's the, the, the golden rule. Are you kidding me? That's in there too. Do unto others what you would have them do unto you. That's all in the same sermon, the same time that Jesus sat down with his disciples and taught them. The Lord's Prayer, right? That's also in Matthew chapter 5. So it's very familiar, but sometimes we don't see how it all fits together. And I hope to do that, to, to fit those things together and to help you see the way those things fit together as we study the Sermon on the Mount this, um, over these next few weeks. Tons of, of familiar passages all together. You know, sometimes what we do is we, when we study God's word, there's, there's a, I just want to caution you about something, which is we find a verse we really like, and we pick that verse out, and we go, I really like this one. I like this one a lot. And we hold that verse up, and we write it down on something, or we buy something that has the verse on it, or we post a picture about it. And that's all good so far. All that's good so far. But we have to make sure we understand the context from which we plucked that verse out. Right? If, we're, if we don't get that idea, if we, if we blow past that idea of context, context is very important when you're studying God's word, we need to make sure that we understand how it fits in what we're talking about. The verses right before, the verses right afterwards. And so when we, when we take those verses out and we pick out a favorite one, we've got to make sure we remember th- this idea of remembering where it's coming from. Because there's a risk um, that we... If we don't do that, we might misunderstand the verse. We might misinterpret it. We might misapply it. We might think about that verse in an incorrect way. So we've got to make sure we're understanding the context when we do that. So when you see all of these verses that are super popular, make sure you kind of understand where, it, where, it's, where the flow is and where it fits, that it's a part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord's Prayer is a part of the Sermon of, on the Mount. And people love saying things like, I love the Sermon on the Mount. People that are would not consider themselves Christians. They're, they're people that kind of have maybe a respect of Jesus. They have a healthy appreciation of Jesus. And they go, I like Jesus. I like the teachings of Jesus, but I'm not a big fan of Christians or I'm not a big fan of the church. Um, respectfully, you probably haven't read the Sermon on the Mount, right? If you think that. Like someone who would say that, I like the teachings of Jesus, but I'm not a big fan of Christianity or what Christians believe, but I like what Jesus says. I I think a lot of those people that say those kinds of things haven't actually read the Sermon on the Mount. Because there's some things in there that will make you squirm. They'll make you uncomfortable. You go, what do I do with this? There's, you see the passages that we will read over the next few weeks, the verses where Jesus is raising the bar for the standard of holiness that he requires. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. A lot of people say they like the teachings of Jesus and probably have not ever read the Sermon on the Mount. The Mount. There was a uh, a teacher at Texas A and M back in the eighties. Her name was Virginia Owens, and she's a writer and a uh, she was teaching a liter- literature class with a group of uh, undergraduates at Texas A and M. And a part of this literature class in their textbook, they had the Sermon on the Mount. They had Matthew five, six, and seven, this teaching of Jesus, and she assigned it to her students. This is a you know, public college and state college, Texas A&M, I'm, I'm assuming. Um, but a non-Christian college is what I'm saying. But assign this teachings of Jesus as a literature assignment and then task them with writing a response paper. And again, you've probably heard people say, I like Jesus or I like the teachings of Jesus, but I don't like Christianity or what Christians believe. And so with that in mind, do you think, what do you think they thought about the Sermon on the Mount? Do you think they loved it? This was the best ever. I loved the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of them were unfamiliar with it. Half of them had probably never heard of the Sermon on the Mount. They hated the Sermon on the Mount. (laughs) That was their response. She collected their responses, and she says, stack of the papers turned in, and she starts reading them, and they are very negative about the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, here's a quote from one of the papers. I did not like the Sermon on the Mount. It made me feel I had to be perfect. And we will see that the Sermon on the Mount says some difficult things. And people's response, even when Jesus gave it for the first time, was an emotional response. In fact, the scripture tells us that people were astonished. If you look at 728, it says, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Then it goes on to say, I don't think this will be on the screen, but it says, For he was teaching them as one who had authority authority. 
and not as their scribes. They were shocked by what Jesus said. They were blown away by it. And part of it was the way he was teaching it to them. It was, you know, Jesus said to them in, later in chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, do not do this, like do, do not uh, murder. But I say to you, anyone who looks at someone with anger in their hearts or say, you know, says this word towards somebody, um, that's like murder. And think about the audacity of saying something like that if you're not Jesus. You know, the Bible says this, but I say... I say this, how that would have come across to the first people who ever heard it, I would be shocked too, right? Jesus was teaching with authority and the response, this emotion that people were feeling when they heard it. And I, I, want, to, I want to get us back to that place where we're looking at it with fresh eyes as much as possible. And it's difficult because it's so familiar, but, but again, to see it all together is kind of unfamiliar. And I think even in culturally and maybe even in this room, there's some unfamiliarity, even though there's some familiarity at the same time. So what is the Sermon on the Mount? What is this teaching? What is the kind of big idea of this Sermon on the Mount? Is this an unrealistic ideal? This is like, in a perfect world, here's how everyone would treat each other. Is that what the Sermon on the Mount is? Is it a, the standard for entrance into God's family? You must be perfect if you want a relationship with God. Is that what it is? Is it, is it a standard for life at another time? It was it, this is like, this is what I'm calling you to live like in the first century because we're establishing the church and I need all of you on your best behavior. But later this is going to be, we're going to loosen the, the standards a little bit. You know, what is, what is the Sermon on the Mount? I think the Sermon on the Mount is the kingdom. It is a description of life in God's kingdom. It covers a wide variety of, of life um, and our eternal life. It talks about prayer. It talks about worship. It talks about relationships. It talks about how we handle our money. There's so many things that are covered in the Sermon on the Mount. It really, in short, it is who we are, and it's who we are to be and what we are to do. The Sermon on the Mount will cover these things. So the first thing is it's familiar but unfamiliar. The second thing is it, it shows us the contrast between the old kingdom and the new kingdom. The old kingdom and the new kingdom. We see this word kingdom all over this sermon. We see it there in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we will see a contrast between the, the normal way of doing things. Normal, quote, finger quotes, normal way of doing things, and God's way of doing things, or God's way of being, God's way of living. We'll see this contrast over and over again between the way the world typically does things and the way that God wants, us, wants things to be done. It is, um, and these things, as we study, we will see that they deal with things on something deeper than a surface level. I want to show you a picture of an iceberg to illustrate what I'm talking about today. So Tim Mackey is a pastor in, in Portland. If you've ever seen the Bible Project videos, he's the guy, the voice behind a lot of those videos. And this is a picture of an iceberg. You can see it a little bit. There's some other pictures you've seen where it's something like 10% of a typical iceberg. 10% of the, the iceberg is above the water and 90% of it is below the water. And a lot of times when we look at the spiritual life, we, we look at it on a really s surface level. And it's like that 10%. And we think about our behavior, we think about our actions, and we don't think about our heart as much. And Jesus challenges this in the Sermon on the Mount because he's challenging the stuff that's below the water, the stuff that's below the surface, the stuff that's in our hearts, the stuff that fuels our actions. And the things that, that are, you know, again, underneath the surface that, that causes us to relate to people and to relate to God in a certain way. The Sermon on the Mount will challenge that and speak to us on a really deep level. And where it is, where, where this lands, is we see that there is a battle between kingdoms. There's the old kingdom and the new kingdom. In the new kingdom, the way that God, um, the, the life that God is calling us to, the, this new way of relating to God that Jesus makes possible, 
is, is, is what the Sermon on the Mount is about. It's about life in his kingdom and about how to have a relationship with God. And this idea of kingdom comes up over and over and over again. And if you think about this, this is an interesting idea that we are not real familiar with in America in 2019, right? We got, we have, I, I love, by the way, being in a country that is a democracy. I'm so grateful for that. I think this is the best political system created by humanity to live in a democracy. I'm appreciative of that, that we get to vote and and things like that. But um, I think we're all on the same page when I could say that our political system is not perfect. Is that that an overstatement? We think it's perfect? Okay, we're good. We're all clear with that. It's not perfect. There's some things that are off a little bit, like some things that we feel uncomfortable with collectively as people, like, oh, This isn't going like we would hope it would. Speaking of the gap between the way things should be and the way they ought to be, right? We can see that in our political system as well. And, you know, there there would be, here's, here's, when you think about politics, like getting things done, solving problems collectively as people, that's kind of what we're trying to do through politics. We're trying to tackle issues or make sure we all have paved roads to ride on and we have police and fire, you know, fire trucks and things like that. And so how do, we, how do we solve the problems that we're trying to solve collectively? And if you think about solving a problem, you realize how complicated it is. You pick any, any issue. Like, I mean, we were talking about poverty this morning and trying to solve the issue of poverty or trying to, um, you know, homelessness, the issue of homelessness is a complicated issue. It's a complicated issue. And if you've ever been in the trenches trying to solve a problem, I used to work with the Union Gospel Mission. That was my first job when I first came to Spokane. I just worked at the thrift store, but I would get to work with uh, people from, uh, from the, the mission. And they were going through their program, and, and part of being a part of that was they would serve over at the thrift store and help us sort things. And I would talk to these guys and, and hear about their lives and hear about just the, the issues that they're dealing with. And when you, you start to talk about addiction, you start to talk about even brokenness and the broken families that they came from, and you begin to realize, boy, this is complicated. To solve a problem, to do good in the world is a complicated problem. And then our political systems sometimes complicate them even more, right? Where there's bureaucracy that they have to deal with, and there's ways that people try to help that don't actually help anybody. They just cause more problems. And there, there's all these things that are just complicated, and so you begin to think, like, how, what political system would be perfect? What political system would, would be better than what we have? And you think about, well, that bureaucracy can be fr- pretty frustrating sometimes. To deal with, trying to solve a problem and you have to talk to, like, 20 people and you can't do the things that you're trying to do because there's so much top-heavy things, government going on. So what you need is you need one person who can make a lot of decisions. And that's the way it is, like, in, in some places around the world, you got one person that can make all that they do all the call, you make all the calls. They're the big person that has all the power. But you all know there's a problem with that too, right? Because power can corrupt people, right? You give someone a ton of power, there's a saying. It's so common, there's a saying for it that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? So you give someone a ton of power. And they might have started out with a good person, good intentions, and that power goes to their head. They get prideful, and they start corrupting things, and they, they start becoming, you know, that, that power messes with them and corrupts them. So you need someone that's beyond corruption, someone that has the ultimate power, but also is ultimately good. And then you get a sense of, like, how, how refreshing it would be to have someone who is holy and pure but also has all of the power. It can make things happen just by saying the word. And then then you start to think about, what would that be like if God was our king? If God was our king? Because God is absolutely holy and he's beyond corruption. God will never let power go to his head. He already has all the power and has for all eternity. And what if God was in charge? And as Christians, we believe that one day he will be. Right, they, We await the return of our Savior and this, this idea of Jesus as king. And that one day that political system will be perfect. But in the meantime, right, we have this longing, we have this sense of God's kingdom that Jesus came to bring in. And there's this already but not yet peace. Right? And we're in this in-between time. Where, where for those of us who are followers of Christ, we say Jesus is our king. 
He is the leader. He is the one that's our ultimately, our, our allegiance is ultimately to him. He's the one who has the say in our lives. But we live in this world where there's these old kingdoms, these old way of doing things that we are susceptible to, that we are surrounded by. And there's a conflict. There's a gap between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The old kingdom versus the new kingdom is a very real dynamic and a very real reality that we, we deal with here. And the way that we become a part of God's kingdom, Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says it explicitly in, in chapter 5, verse 20. And he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And here you're supposed to gulp, like, oh, uh-oh. Right? That's what they would have done when they first heard it, the emotions of someone hearing this for the first time. But Jesus is going to let him off the hook soon. But before he does that, he says, hey, unless you are better than the best people you know, unless you are more righteous than the people that have the reputation for being the most righteous people in the world, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And then later he says it even more explicitly in verse 48 of chapter 5. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Oswald Chambers says the Sermon on the Mount produces despair in the heart of the natural man. And that is the very thing Jesus means it to do. Because immediately we reach the point of despair, we are willing to come to Jesus as beggars and receive from him. We read it in Matthew 5, 3 that, just close my Bible, I need to leave that open. Matthew 5, there it is on the screen. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, tech team. This is what this passage is talking about. People who are impoverished spiritually and recognizing that fact are now ready to receive the kingdom of heaven. It's this, what the old song says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. And nothing, I, can't, I can't bring anything to the table when it comes to eternity. When it comes to having a relationship with God, I come with, you know, I'm like the pockets inside out guy, you know, like I don't have anything. I have nothing to bring here. My hands are empty. But that means now my hands are open and ready to receive what, what only Jesus can give. Sinclair Ferguson said this about this passage. He said this, We begin to realize about this life that Jesus brings, that it's not something that we can work up, but it's something that must come down. We cannot work up enough perfection to be able to have this life and to be a part of God's kingdom. It's something that we must only receive. It's something that must come down to us as a gift. The final point about the Sermon on the Mount that we're going to talk about this morning is that we see in the Sermon on the Mount a contrast between the self and our new life. Self versus our new life. I, love, I don't know who said this first, but if I could kick the person most responsible for my problems, I wouldn't be able to sit down for weeks. Um, we face a fundamental question when we consider the life that Jesus brings, and it's, it's do we live for ourselves or do we live for God's kingdom? And we will see that our self is, has got to, got to give up. It's got to actually die to receive what Jesus gives us. That how we receive that new life it's through a death of sorts, not a physical death, but this idea of laying down our priorities and our, our just sense of ourselves being the most important thing in our relationships with, between God and ourselves. It has to be God that is ultimately important and God's priorities that are ultimately the important ones to us. That if we are to receive that life that only Jesus brings us, that means we're going to have to let him live our lives, him, his life through us and not to be people that are 
insistent upon being self-sufficient in every way. We have to be God-sufficient. We have to be, let Jesus provide that life and give that life to us. George Mueller, um, who served the, the orphans of England back in the 1800s, was a great man of faith. And if you don't know George Mueller, I encourage you to read about his life. He was an interesting, fascinating individual that God worked through in powerful ways and someone of great faith. He said this about this concept of dying to ourselves to receive what Jesus has. There was a day when I died, utterly died, died to George Mueller and his opinions, preferences, tastes, and will, died to the world, its approval or censure, died to the approval or blame of even my brethren and friends. And since then, I've studied only to show myself approved unto God. Being poor in spirit, approaching God with just empty and open hands is is such an important part of the kingdom. It's such an important part of this life with Jesus. It's actually how we begin a relationship with Jesus as well. we, We come to that relationship needing grace. And isn't it beautiful? We sang, that was our theme this morning with worship. God's grace. Because there's another kind of death that's, that's critical to that kingdom life. Right? We talked about death of ourself, but only, that only matters because of Christ's death on the cross. That Jesus died for us. Jesus lived that perfect life. And Jesus paid for the, the ability to have that life. That we might have a relationship with him because of his death on the cross. God's grace is available to us so that we can have a relationship with him. And so we must realize that Jesus is not an example of the life we are to live only. Like that's not, that's part of what he is, but he's not just an example of the life we are to live. He is the provider of that life. He's not just an example of the life we are to live. He is the one who will give that life to us through a relationship with him. That again, we come to him empty handed. We receive that grace that he offers us. And it's a beautiful thing. Kyle Eidelman uh, wrote a book called The End of Me, where he's reflecting on the Beatitudes, which is what we're going to study next Sunday. We actually did the first one today, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But he wrote a whole book about just these, these blessed are statements in, in Matthew chapter 5. And it's called The End of Me. It's this idea where he's, he's talking about dying to ourselves so that we might have what Jesus offers us. And I, I love this, this passage, or I love this, uh, this quote from his book. I'm going to close the sermon with this. He says, Dear me, I've known you for as long as I can remember. So it's a letter to himself. Dear me, I've known you for as long as I can remember. I once heard there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and yes, that's us. Though I don't know it's what the proverb was talking about. I've been close to a lot of people, but you and me, we have quite an attachment. Looking back, it's fair to say I've treated you pretty well. As a matter of fact, more times than I can count, I've put you ahead of anything and everything else. Agreed? As we were growing up, I tried to make sure you were always at the front of the line. I saw to it that you got the biggest cookie on the plate, the best parking spot, the comfiest chair in any room we entered. In school, I noticed the little things you liked, and I went after them. You always loved attention, so I did everything in my power to see that you got it. You still like the spotlight. So I've maneuvered to keep you in its glare. Now that we have the internet, I have more tools. I post only the pictures that show you at your very best. Anybody would think you're living the dream. Have you seen the comments people write about you? When you have struggled or had a hard time, I've done my best to keep that our little secret. I've tried to make you happy. Sure, it was a little easier to keep you happy when you were a cute little tyke. A simple temper tantrum got the job done. Then as we grew older, I had to be a little more discreet. You wanted to keep winning and getting your way, all the while looking humble and unassuming. That gets tricky, not to mention tiring. As a matter of fact, you never seem to care about dull stuff like bills and consequences and what happens tomorrow. I've said more than a few harsh words on your behalf to certain people, and you never warned me about the mess. You never told me I couldn't unsay what I've said. I love you, me, but I can't keep living for you. You always insisted that if I just keep you happy, then I'd be happy. Simple as that. But you know what? It's not as simple as that. It never has been. Me, I've let you be in, the, in control and sit in the driver's seat, but it's clear you can't be trusted. 
You keep insisting you know the way we should go, but it always seems to be a dead end. I've looked into some other options, and I've decided to begin a journey down a different path. It's narrow and difficult, and not many choose it, but it leads to real and abundant life. However, and there is no easy way to say this, I can't take this path if I bring you along. So me, this is the end of you. Sincerely, me. All right, let's pray.